welcome everyone. Um, we're very excited to have you all and uh, to welcome our distinguished panelists. I'll introduce them very briefly and then hand over the floor uh, to them. We have, um, so I'm not sure how the screen is uh, displaying for you, but um, uh, the lady with us is Judge Donahue <laughs> of the International Court of Justice. The gentleman who likely is next to her is Professor John Crook, uh, who's, who described himself as a retired civil servant, but his, uh, his statement of service is much longer than that. <laughs> and uh, we've got Dr. Kian Murphy, who's a reader in law at the University of Bristol. And with that, I'll hand over to Judge Donahue. Well, thank you, Hafiz, for uh, that introduction. And I'd like to welcome all of you to today's panel, which is entitled David D. Karen and International Adjudication and Arbitration. I have been a judge on the International Court of Justice in The Hague for the past 10 years, but I first got to know David Karen in the early 1990s when he and I were both working on international environmental issues. And he actually hosted me uh, when I visited uh, the law school at Berkeley for a year uh, uh, doing research in that topic. I had gone to law school there uh, previously in the 80s. Much more recently, David served as a judge ad hoc on the International Court of Justice until his death. And during that same period, he served as an arbitrator on an investment tribunal in which I'm presiding. So I had the great privilege of sitting with David both on the ICJ and in arbitration. And in that arbitration in which I'm presiding, uh, we held a one week remote hearing in August. Uh, I often wondered during that hearing and as we were getting it organized, how David might have approached remote proceedings. He was an arbitration expert, but fundamentally always an optimist. So I'm sure that when the pandemic hit and many of us were kind of frozen in our tracks, he would immediately have realized that the arbitral community could successfully conduct proceedings remotely. And I think he also would have recognized perhaps before many others that these devices would work quite well and therefore that even when the pandemic ceases to control every aspect of our life, which we hope will eventually occur, uh, it will remain worthwhile for practitioners to hone their skills in remote advocacy, which of course is exactly uh, why people are participating in this course. So today we'll hear some different perspectives from people who uh, have known David over the years. Uh, and first we'll hear from Hafiz Birjay, the president of Delos Dispute Resolution, who received his LLM at Berkeley, where David was on the faculty and first met David there. And he'll share some of his insights gleaned from his association with David. And then we're, we'll hear from John Crook, whose association with Professor Karen dates back to the early 1980s when they were both involved in the work of the Iran-US Claims Tribunal. I'm particularly glad that the participants today will have a chance to hear about that tribunal. It's been a proving ground for the effectiveness of the UNCTRAL rules. And that of course has to a considerable extent of something of a technical aspect, but stepping back a, a bit, more generally, its existence over dec decades shows that state to state disputes can be settled in a hearing room, even when the relationship between the two states is the relationship that has existed throughout that period between Iran and the United States. And then our last panelist will be Professor uh, Kean Murphy, uh, a reader in law at the University of Bristol and David's former colleague at Dixon Poon School of Law at King's College in London, who has also served as a tribunal assistant to David. Uh, before I turn to the panelists, just a small uh, housekeeping comment if there's time after the panel presentations, uh, we could uh, take some questions. And if you want to ask questions, either during the presentations or at the end, please do so by using the Q&A function that appears at the bottom of your screen, which I'll then have a look at and uh, time permitting, I'll, uh, I'll uh, pose those questions. Uh, if you're able to indicate uh, who you are uh, and if you want a particular panelist to answer, if you could undertake that as well, that will be helpful. So uh, I'll then uh, turn things over to our first panelist. Hafiz, please go ahead. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Um, I must admit it's not without uh, some nervosity that I'm going first, partly because David Karen is uh, talking about him is no small task, but also because uh, we have such a distinguished panel and audience. Now, before being a leading academic and arbitrator and the founding advisor of DELOS and co-chair of the DELOS Guide to, to Arbitration Places, David was my LLM professor at Berkeley and had a profound influence on me. And I'll structure my comments around two of his many wonderful qualities, which helped shape my own outlook on my profession and shaped Delos as well. Generosity and being deeply insightful. David was generous with his time, with his knowledge, with his networks. And maybe to help you situate the scene as it were, um, so we're in Berkeley in California, imagine a large classroom, rectangular tables um, um, set out around the room in a rectangle, so obviously empty in the middle. You've got students all around the table, mid twenties to late thirties. And on one side, you've got a consumer professor practicing the Socratic method with no apparent effort, but so effectively. This class was known as RPID, for the resolution of private international disputes. Its focus was commercial arbitration, but with a wider lens, so that we could see and engage with the place of arbitration as an exceptional form of dispute resolution. And I will return to this in a moment. While formally we learned about US case law and statute, really what we were receiving was an education to the fundamentals of arbitration, which was complemented by discussions with David's visiting guests and the insights he would share about the practice of arbitration. Now, David didn't close the door at the end of his class. He took an interest in who we are, who we were, what our plans were. He made connections with his peers for our benefit, and he was available to discuss outside of class. And because pictures speak much louder than words, I thought I'd just share um, something. I can pull it up there. Um, that, was, that picture was taken at, uh, at a dinner he hosted for the class at his home, which was overlooking the Bay Area. And you can probably tell by, the, by our faces uh, how much uh, we enjoy this and uh, what a close interaction we enjoyed. Now, the rela this relationship with David informed how it was that my six co-founders and I had turned to him and to Pierre Meyer as Delos' founding advisors. And I will note here that uh, I met Professor Pierre Meyer when I started practicing at Deckert Paris, in Paris rather than during my studies. And that's also where I met several of my uh, other co-founders. We reached out to David and Pierre because we felt comfortable being steered by them. It's a flip side of their generous outlook. We had a vision. We had designed a coherent intellectual system grounded in practice. And we were privileged to be able to count on them for what we lacked in experience and credibility. Which brings me to the second trait I wished to highlight. David was not only brilliant, he was also deeply insightful. Our first conversation about Delos was in February, 2015. At the time, he was uh, the Dean of the Dixon Poon School of Law, King's College London. And when we uh, met, was in London on the Strand. Now, just so you have the, so you can picture where we were at at that time, um, Delos was a very early stage startup. And to speak startup ease, our USP or unique selling point was, and still is, time and cost efficiency in arbitration. To this end, Delos had a minimum viable product, MVP, which consisted of rules of arbitration and the necessary basic infrastructure around them to allow for the administration of cases. And while we had achieved insertion of clauses into several dozen contracts, those were still very early days. We hadn't yet reached to use yet another startup acronym, POC, namely proof of concept, which would, in our 
uh, environment in the first case, which was filed in the last days of 2016. So at this coffee, for the former student talking to the former professor, I sat there very nervously explaining this crazy initiative we'd been working on. And he listened attentively and eventually concluded that he saw a lot of potential in this initiative. And he shared some initial thoughts, which I will share with you in turn, um, and which I will organize into uh, three themes just to make it easier in terms of flow. Um, you'll see that I'm starting with the comments to do with council, but uh, this is not to say that it's all on council. His comments also addressed the role of arbitrators. First, he said that council should act responsibly. Yes, we have arbitrators who have been designated to decide the dispute and in a sense, give everyone the answer to the problem. But council also have a responsibility not to over lawyer their case, as opposed to dumping on the arbitrators everything that might tentatively be relevant. So not as opposed to, um, meaning they shouldn't be dumping. Um, and, they should, and on the contrary, what they should be doing is helping arbitrators to understand their case. And here, as an example, he gave the double voice protocol. Second, arbitrators should manage their cases proactively so as to narrow the issues in dispute. That is irrespective of whether council act responsibly. And here, the example he gave was the Kaplan opening. His point was that time and cost efficiency correlate directly to the volume of issues under discussion and how long those are being discussed for. And it is for the decision maker to guide the parties in this respect. But then he added a caveat, it is also for the parties to pay attention to the signals given by the decision maker. The third point he made was that the dispute resolution process should be one of quality. And this is supported, for example, through arbitrator availability and arbitrators learning the case. And here what I will suggest is that you listen to the recording of the Goff lecture once it is available, which Lucy Reed delivered yesterday on David Caron's rule of X. At the end of this first coffee meeting, David was kind enough to agree there and then to join us as a founding advisor. And you can imagine my excitement and that of my co-founders. Um, and he did so alongside Pierre Mayer, who had uh, taken up the role earlier on. I recall Pierre commenting about David that he had class. In French, il a la classe. Indeed, every, David's response to the Delos Initiative and to what we're trying to build had been characteristically generous and savvy. Having got comfort about how everything fitted together and where we were at, he didn't dwell on the many ways in which we might subsequently fail. He focused instead on making sure we were thinking of this in realistic, sensible terms and challenged us to explore further some of our key concepts. As some of you know, the last rules take a holistic approach to arbitration. We looked at the contract formation stage, the situation prior to the start of action, initiating arbitration, forming the tribunal, what happens during the arbitration and at its conclusion, and the time and costs involved for all stakeholders. We looked at whether the interests of every actor in the process were aligned. You might say we applied a light version of rational choice theory from the perspective of maximizing utility for the users of arbitration. And I mentioned this because for my part, I can probably trace my inclination to think in terms of stakeholder interests to my second semester at Berkeley, when at David's recommendation, I audited two MBA classes at Haas, the Berkeley Business School. Now fast forward from my masters to five or seven years ago, when we started Delos and then reached out to Pierre and to David, what I didn't know then, and only realized much later on, was how fortunate we had been that the arbitration leaders we had turned to could guide us with their similar outlook 
on the practice of arbitration. With hindsight, it was a perfect match. And had it been any other way, I probably wouldn't be here to tell the story today. Now to conclude, one of the drivers for the Delos project was to make arbitration accessible. And I had seen in David's class how the development of arbitration could not be taken for granted and questions about its scope often blurred into questions about its legitimacy. My founders and I saw this as well in our practices, not just with startups, but also with larger, more sophisticated players. In this, as in everything else, David's contribution to our project will always be remembered and cherished. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Hafiz. And uh, let's hear now from John Crook. Uh, I suggest you have a quick look at his bio, which I believe is available to you because he's certainly more than a retired civil service servant and among other things, he and David authored a book together on the, uh, on the Iran US Claims Tribunal about which he'll speak. So David, uh, sorry, uh, John, over to you, please. All right, thank, thank you, Judge. And thanks to Delos for this opportunity to uh, speak about our dear friend, uh, David Karen. Uh, David was a dear friend. Um, all I regret that our sort of separate life trajectories in later years uh, prevented us from getting together very often. Uh, I first met David in 1983, which is a very long time ago. Uh, he was newly arrived in The Hague, where the Iran-US Claims Tribunal was situated. Uh, he was joining the staff of the tribunal as a legal assistant of first uh, to Judge Mosk, but then uh, spending most of his time with Judge Charles Brower, who uh, uh, was a sort of dear friend of David's and a, 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 a mentor and supporter through the years. Uh, I was the newly arrived US agent, which is the resident uh, US representative uh, at the tribunal. Let me give you a little background about the tribunal so that you can have some context for understanding David's uh, experiences there and how they may have uh, shaped his uh, thinking about dispute settlement. Uh, by way of background, in early 1979, a popular revolution in Iran uh, forced out the Shah of Iran uh, and led to the installation of an Islamic government headed by the Ayatollah Khomeini. In November of 1979, supporters of the Ayatollah seized the American embassy in Tehran and took 52 American diplomats, other personnel, uh, staff, hostages. Uh, most of these people were then held for a period of about 14 months. Uh, these events uh, set in train a whole lot of uh, uh, actions in response. And among other things, the United States and uh, countries acting in concert with, uh, with the US uh, froze large amounts of Iranian external assets, uh, including substantial amounts held in US banks. Uh, you can calculate the numbers different ways. Maybe it was 13 billion, maybe it was 10 billion, but in any case, it was a lot of money. And this of course was in 1980 dollars. And to paraphrase a US politician, $10 billion used to be a lot of money. Um, now, before the revolution, there were extensive uh, commercial and investment ties between US and Iranian US parties in Iran. Uh, and these relationships were largely disrupted or ended by the revolution and events associated with the revolution. So uh, a large number, several hundred US parties reacted in the characteristic way, which is to say they sued. And uh, several hundred of them managed to secure attachments on the frozen Iranian assets. Uh, now, there was some debate about whether those attachments were worth very much, but they were, they were there, they were a fact. Uh, now, uh, 
uh, as negotiations became serious late in 1980 and into the first few frantic days in 1981, uh, there, there was a complex negotiation, many parts that had political dimensions, but there was also a financial aspect. Uh, Iran took the position that, you know, one element of the release of the hostages had to be the unfreezing of Iran's external assets. Uh, the Americans took the position that they could not do so without some mechanism for the claims of the holders, those, the, the, the holders of liens on those assets could have their claims adjudicated. Uh, the way the solution to this puzzle uh, was the party's agreement to create a claims settlement institution, the Iran US Claims Tribunal, uh, which would have jurisdiction over claims of US claimants against uh, Iran, defined very broadly in the agreement, uh, and certain claims by the two states against each other, the US against Iran, Iran against the United States. Uh, awards in favor of US claimants were to be paid by a security account uh, that was to be held uh, by the Dutch Central Bank acting under instructions of the uh, Central Bank of Algeria. Uh, drop a note here that uh, this negotiation was very difficult, very complicated. Uh, and it succeeded, I think, in not inconsiderable uh, extent because of some very skillful mediation by the Algerians, uh, for which uh, they were sort of given credit in writing at the time, but I think their role has sort of dropped from view. Uh, but it was, I think, a, a really powerful demonstration of the power of an effective mediator to bring some, some hostile and, and rather difficult uh, participants together to do a complex deal. All right, so the claim settlement declaration creating the tribunal was part of the uh, a package of deals that uh, culminated in the release of the hostages and the unfreezing of uh, um, Iran's assets, say of the amount that uh, went into the security account to pay claims. All right, well, that, that was the tribunal. That was the, the proposition into which uh, David and I parachuted in, uh, in 1983. The tribunal was at that time in business, uh, was hearing and deciding cases. Uh, David was at that point in his early 30s. He had completed his uh, service as a Coast Guard uh, officer. He'd completed his legal studies uh, uh, at Bolt uh, and in Wales. Uh, and he took up his position as uh, legal assistant to, uh, to Judge Mosk and then after Mosk left to, uh, to Charlie Brower. At the time David arrived, the tribunal um, had a, a, a large staff, including a number of uh, young lawyers of, of just exceptional ability who were serving as uh, legal assistants, chamber clerks, uh, various other capacities. David quickly developed his, uh, well, I, 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 my notes, I use the word, the verb deployed, that seems a little cynical. Uh, but in fact, uh, you know, David was an extraordinarily warm guy, very effective at developing human relationships. And he developed a very uh, powerful web of relationships all around the tribunal um, with the, certainly with the uh, you know, Americans, but with the third country nationals and uh, with a number of the uh, Iranian staff uh, as well to say nothing of the uh, the lady who ran the lunchroom and the lady who answered the phone. Uh, I will note that many of the staff from that time, the, the young lawyers have gone on to become some of the real leaders in the profession. I'll talk a little bit in a moment about the educational function that the tribunal served. But I think it's significant to note that a lot of the people with whom David uh, formed these associations in the early eighties are today the leaders in the field. Now, developing these relationships wasn't necessarily an easy thing because the tribunal in the 1980s was a strange, strange place and often a very tense place. The United States and Iran remained uh, in a very uh, intense relationship not too long after I left the tribunal in 87. Indeed, there was a 
sort of significant uh, outbreak of, uh, of, of uh, military action. Uh, a number of people in Tehran hated the very notion of the tribunal, saw it as a sellout to the Americans. A lot of the American claimants were very unhappy to be there. They were made to, show, to present their claims in a new institution, untested institution, and one they simply didn't trust and saw as unbalanced. Um, and some of that overall unhappiness on the part of the claimants reflected the fact that in 1983, uh, arbitration of commercial and investment disputes was a pretty novel thing. You know, we now it's now part of the part of the framework. Some of us pay our bills doing it, but uh, in 1983, it was a, a pretty unfamiliar uh, proposition, certainly for many American lawyers. Because the settlement of the disputes by arbitration was viewed as a preserve of a sort of few a relative elite of uh, arbitrators, most of them European. Uh, and it was not, there were just a handful of US practitioners for whom this was familiar. Um, and moreover, the, the process of arbitration in the tribunal could be very difficult. Um, Iranian parties uh, who were characteristically shorthanded uh, sought and received uh, frequent extensions. Uh, there were interruptions. Uh, from external events, uh, Iran and Iraq engaged in a very brutal war in the 1980s. Tehran was bombed, uh, airlines suspended service, uh, with the result that, uh, at least for a period of time, it was not possible for Iranian parties to travel to The Hague. Um, and there was sort of throughout this uh, an undercurrent of political and sometimes personal tension uh, relieved only by the occasional ping pong tournament. Now, there were some significantly disruptive events. Um, the discovery that a popular uh, interpreter was a Baha'i led to a great deal of consternation and difficulty. In David's second year, uh, the tribunal's future was threatened. Uh, its operations were interrupted for a time uh, when two of the Iranian arbitrators uh, staged a physical assault on a third country arbitrator, uh, leading to me and one of the Iranian uh, chamber clerks uh, stuffing the poor Swede into a phone booth. Um, it was a difficult time. I had a good friend who was an interpreter, a good guy was a very serious Buddhist and he was supremely calm came over to my house one day, our little boys played together. He said, you know, John, if I worried, I'd be worried. Well, uh, we pulled through somehow and the, and the process uh, was put back together, new staff, new arbitrators were appointed uh, and the process worked forward. The cases were decided, uh, the tribunal generated a substantial body of uh, reasoned decisions that has significantly contributed to the law. And David was an important participant in this work. I mean, he was just a legal assistant, but he was much more. Uh, he negotiated the way through a lot of uh, uh, difficulties uh, with the legal assistance of other arbitrators. Uh, and it sort of had a, cast his healing balm on some sometimes troubled waters. Now, in the course of this, David was always watching and thinking about what was going on around him. And he saw as, as a lot of us, he's perhaps less clearly discerned, that a law-based international dispute settlement institution could be made to work. The point that Judge Donahue made a minute ago, uh, even in the sort of very difficult circumstances, there's a very difficult political relationship, the institution could be made to work. Now, David took careful note of what was going on. Now, a few years later, David and I uh, pulled together a, a, a book uh, about with our reflections on the tribunal. I, I, I look at it, and sometimes you may have the experience that God, you used to be smart. You know, you could. <laughs> we were really insightful, but uh, I think the the book. Um, was really not about 
substantive law. It was about process and about institutions, the things that David thought about and wrote, wrote about a great deal in his uh, later career. Um, and I, I, he, we made a point in the book that I think was particularly carry, particularly uh, powerful with respect to the tribunal that, you know, processes and institutions aren't just rules. Uh, here's what we wrote. The life and processes of an institution are not just the result of formal rules. Much depends on people, on the intangibles of their character and culture of the development and life of the tribunal shows the importance of this. Uh, we go on, many of the essays in this book illustrate the ways in which intersections of culture shape the process. David was keenly aware of the role of uh, intangibles, culture, human character, uh, and their effect on the dispute settlement process. Now, um, Again, Judge Donahue alluded to this, one of the tribunal's strengths led to uh, some of David's uh, most important contributions to the practice of international dispute settlement. And this was the decision by Iran and the US uh, to build into the institutional DNA of the tribunal, uh, the uncentral arbitration rules, which in 1983 were sort of brand new and not hadn't been run tested very much. They had been developed in the 70s to, to, to provide a uh, legal structure that was acceptable to common lawyers, civilians, and in those days, Soviet lawyers, who of course were at that point a significant player in the legal process. Uh, but they hadn't, they had been approved by the GA in 76, but they hadn't really had uh, significant exposure. Well, the tribunal, adopted them, may have mod tinkered with them a little bit at the margins, but basically conducted its process under the uncontrolled rules. And they showed the rules worked. They provided a flexible, strong structure that could hold up even under all of the pressure and weirdness of arbitration between uh, sometimes very antagonistic parties. Now, David uh, deployed one of his uh, important, although I think thinks perhaps not uh, widely appreciated characteristics as a pack rat and collector of papers and books. Uh, and he gathered up every ruling on the tribunal uh, related to application of the procedural of the unstable rules. Um, he and some very distinguished colleagues turned this into uh, the leading treatise on the uncontrolled rules. Now that's the second edition. You know, they, uh, he and another very distinguished college up, uh, updated it a few years later. But it remains uh, sort of the practical toolkit for all of us who are involved in um, periodically trying to uh, apply the rules in difficult situations. Uh, I have to say both of, both my copies are sitting up there on the uh, on the bookcase with sort of lovely inscriptions from David. Now, while David's day job could be very practical, um, if sometimes a little strange, uh, he also began in these years to uh, develop as a scholar. Uh, summers could be a little slow at the tribunal and particularly when uh, Ramadan uh, happened during high summer. So a lot of the staff headed for the Alps or the beach or you know someplace else, David signed up for the uh, a general course at the Hague Academy, uh, and in, uh, I think it was 1984, uh, received the Hague Academy's diploma, which was an award of which he was always very proud. Um, he also uh, began work on a, a doctoral degree uh, at the law school at Leiden, which he completed while he was in the Hague. Um, Leiden has a rather formal ceremony for the final conferral of the degree. The, uh, the candidate and two of his uh, supporters appear uh, wearing white tie. Um, and in those days, apparently wearing top hats as well um, before a panel of uh, berobed uh, academics where he was examined. Um, David was very proud of this experience. He would uh, had delighted in recounting uh, the tale. Uh, Leiden has a lovely little video there of a, of a modern uh, degree ceremony of this kind. They, they apparently still do this and the applicants still show up with uh, uh, their supporters wearing white tie. Um, David referred to 
a sword playing some role in this ceremony. I don't didn't see a sword in evidence in the modern video, but uh, perhaps I perhaps I missed it. Uh, but he uh, he secured his degree uh, before he left uh, the tribunal. Now David left the tribunal sometime I think about 1985. He, he returned to San Francisco. He practiced law in a uh, celebrated law firm for a time and then uh, moved uh, across the bay to Berkeley where he began his uh, academic career and began his next uh, stage in the stellar professional career that uh, has made such contributions to the law and such contributions to uh, the lives of, of so many people. So David had uh, a lot of accomplishments. Uh, Life cut too short with lots of work still underway and projects uncompleted and cases not yet decided. Uh, but in a lot of this work, I think in his professional life and his thinking about dispute settlement and his understanding of all of the uh, imponderables and intangibles that uh, go into the process of dispute settlement. Uh, his thinking was greatly shaped, uh, as has been mine, by those uh, few uh, very intense, uh, exciting, if sometimes weird, years in the Iran-U.S. Claims Tribunal. Well, thank Back you, John. Th thank you, John, for, for those uh, remarks, which I think integrate uh, very well the personal aspects of David's uh, persona and his uh, professional side as well. So let's hear some more now from Dr. Kean Murphy. Please go ahead, Kean. Apologies, I had myself muted. Uh, thank you very much, Judge Anne, who I'm grateful uh, to you for the introduction and to Delos for the opportunity to contribute today. Um, sadly, unlike Professor Crook and unlike Judge Donahue, I did not know David for decades, uh, only a few short years. Uh, and unlike both Judge Donahue and President Vergy, I'm not a fellow Bolte. I'm not a, a Berkeley alum. David and I met when he was appointed Dean of our law school. And in what proved to be the last few years of his life, I had the opportunity to assist him in a number of capacities in his role as Dean, in the settlement of certain disputes, and once in turning off the alarm on his electric teal Thunderbird. David passed suddenly at the age of 65, and he was, as he often said, a young man in the world of international law. In part because of this, for me, his legacy is not so much in books or judgments that bear his name. Now, don't get me wrong, there are many books and articles. Uh, chief among them are books that have already been mentioned today about international disputes, such as the commentary on the Uncitral Rules with Matty Blonpa and Lee Kaplan, or the collection on the operation of the Iran-US Claims Tribunal with Professor Crook. But I think it's also fair to say that in the years to come, he would surely have written books that would be key treaties on international dispute settlement one of which I'll return to. And of course, David has written arbitral awards and even opinions as a judge ad hoc of the International Court of Justice. But again, having had three judicial appointments in The Hague in three years, with the decades work before him on the Iran-US Claims Tribunal and several arbitrations ongoing, we've lost some significant contributions to international jurisprudence. For me, his key legacy, therefore, is in his work as a teacher. For just shy of three decades, David taught students at Berkeley and London and throughout the world. More than that, he was a teacher in everything he did, inside and outside the classroom. Rarely did a conversation go by without David looking to impart a lesson about some topic of interest. Chief among these interests was the settlement of international disputes. David's experience in this field began, as Professor Crook has said, with his appointment as clerk to judges Mosk and Brower at the Claims Tribunal, 
As he set off for The Hague, he sought in the library a book that would tell him about the tribunal's operation. It wasn't there. It hadn't been written. Thus was sparked a lifelong commitment to observe and understand these institutions. His greatest of these observations came, again as a teacher, in his Hague Academy lectures in 2006. And the manuscript from those lectures has not yet been published in its entirety. The working title is A Political Theory of International Courts and Tribunals. And chapter one begins as follows. International law scholars can forget that international courts and tribunals, ICTs, are a specialized form of international organization. By this, I do not mean that the work of the judges or arbitrators is political in some coarse way. The enduring image of ICTs is that they offer the means to decide impartially and independently a question by the application of pre-existing rules and principles. Although, as I will argue, this image may not in fact be realized for several reasons, it is nonetheless the case that ICTs, like all courts, are institutions offering a distinct type of mechanism. In reminding legal scholars that ICTs are international organizations, I seek to emphasize that ICTs, like all institutions, at their best are created within a political context and for a political purpose. So David believed that the adjudicator should understand context, but the adjudicator's work was bound by jurisdiction. For him, a court or tribunal's jurisdiction was key to its function, the thing that should guide its operation above all else. His approach to problems was therefore a restrained one. He did not think lawyers should overpromise outcomes, but did believe in participation in processes. If the work of international lawyers entails the pursuit of peace, the means of that pursuit for David is to tend to institutions and treat rules with care. A useful illustration of this point is David's 2011 lecture at the Law Library of Congress, Images of the Arctic and the Futures They Suggest. The lecture canvasses a range of questions about the Arctic and its ecological, economic, political, diplomatic, and legal futures. One question, which he described then in 2011 as dormant, was what is US policy long-term regarding economic and political relations with Greenland? This like much else has proven prescient, but David did not advocate a policy or at least not about Greenland. His only prescription in general in the lecture was that the United States should ratify the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. It was about participation, not about outcomes. David also had his contrarian side in practicing virtue inside international arbitration, a collection he co-edited. He published Regulating Opacity, Shaping How Tribunals Think. Written at a time when a rising sea of critics called for greater transparency and accountability, David sought to remind us of the need also for space in which adjudicators and arbitrators can do their work. What then about the nuts and bolts of that work? What lessons can I share from under the hood of the Thunderbird? There are three. For David, first, the lawyer's initial task is to sit with complexity. Second, the path towards a solution may involve an as-if approach. And third, in seeking solutions, we must strive for elegance. Sit with complexity. David held that in the face of a legal problem or a problem to which there might be a legal solution, neither the advocate nor the adjudicator should rush towards an outcome. Advocates should be aware that their mode of operation privileges the one dimensional view. It is a necessary view, but not the only one. Adjudicators, while being mindful of the context which shapes institutions, must keep focus on the task with which they are seized. 
take an as-if approach. On more than one occasion, if I was uncertain whether a political, sorry, particular solution was feasible, David would tell me to proceed as if it were. Often, he believed, the seeming limits on what's feasible would be based on preconceived notions of what ought to be. Doing away with these notions and approaching the task with care and with imagination could lead to an outcome. Now, in hindsight, maybe he was just saying, do it my way. But if he was, he was saying it with grace. And finally, strive for elegance. In 2012 remarks to the American Society of International Law, David gave a wide ranging account of elegance and called for lawyers to pay it greater heed. He exhorted that we distrust complex solutions to complex problems and seek instead those that are elegant. In setting elegance in opposition to complexity, he appears to favor simplicity. There are certainly times, as Hafez has already averred, when lawyers arrive at outcomes which, though seemingly satisfactory, are far more complex than needs be. Who knows what problems lie in that unnecessary complexity, a complexity which future lawyers, in turn, may have to sit with. If all of this sounds a bit gnomic to you, hard to unpack and maybe even self-contradictory, well, it does to me too. And more importantly, I think it did for David. His approach was both instinctive and intellectual, bred from observation and reflection with a strong antipathy towards dogma. That means he still had a lot of working out to do. And now those of us left behind will have to do it. So you see, in the time I knew him, even as a judge and arbitrator with an assistant to instruct, David was still a teacher. It is little surprise that when asked, he would choose the title professor over judge. It wasn't that he didn't value the great honor of the bench. He certainly did. Those final years in The Hague were the pinnacle of a stellar career of which he was rightly very proud. But as Professor Karen, he could move between the worlds of universities and libraries and courts and tribunals and share lessons about the law. It was his calling. It's for this reason that I think David would place great store in his commemoration as the figurehead of the first cohort of students from Delis's remote oral advocacy program. As a program, it has several Karenite traits. Mm -hmm. It responds to a new and pressing global need. It aims to develop the practice of international dispute settlement. And perhaps I can be forgiven for suggesting it's the brainchild of a Berkeley alum. It's a fitting tribute indeed. Thank you. Well, thank you, Keen. Uh, well, that, that wraps up uh, the comments by our panelists. Uh, I would just like to say that uh, I very much enjoyed uh, hearing these remarks about David. And of course, I, I knew David, as did the other panelists. Uh, and I'm assuming that uh, those who are in the audience today are hearing about someone who they didn't have the privilege of knowing. So we might wonder, well, OK, we can read what he wrote, but why do we want to understand these personal characteristics? And I ask you to bear in mind the fact that when you're appearing as an advocate before a tribunal, you are essentially communicating with people. That's the task. You heard about David's generosity. There was a capacity that he had to always make the other person feel that David was entirely present and entirely focused on what that person needed at that time. It was very special. Uh, and so that generosity combined, I think, with what we also heard about uh, from Kean as a, a restraint. So generosity as an advocate is not insisting on huge numbers of hours and long page limits, uh, but rather a real ability to treat the uh, others in the process as uh, people to whom one needs to be generous in appreciating their perspectives, their needs, their insights. Um, but also restraint in trying to think about what is the problem we're trying to solve and how can it be solved in this particular setting. So I hope that you'll all have an opportunity to uh, 
uh, give effect to some of the insights that we've tried to share today about David as you go forward in your own uh, work as, uh, as advocates and as practitioners. Um, let's see, I, we haven't got any questions, uh, Hafiz, so perhaps I'll turn it back over to you to close out the event. And I'd like to uh, thank you uh, in doing so for including me today. I've enjoyed it. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you all three uh, for um, joining us, for uh, sharing about your experiences with David. Um, when, um, as a bit of background for the participants, uh, this uh, event, when we were exchanging about the dedication, we were keen that it wasn't just a name, but that it stood for something and that um, that legacy uh, could continue. So thank you for helping us bring that to life.